I think that writing software is one of the most creative, wonderful and complex things that human beings do. But sadly, we often do it pretty badly. How often have you started working in a new code base and thought, this is a delight. How wonderful that I can understand it all and make a contribution straight away. No, I thought not, me neither. So, if there is, optimistically, at least as much bad code as good out there, then what are the bad habits that are common in software development, and how can we avoid them? And no, on this occasion, this is not all about test-driven development. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe, and if you enjoy the video today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're all helping us to grow our channel, so please do support them by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about my views on how to write better software faster, I have a book out now available on LeanPub on Amazon and on Amazon for hard copies. It's called Continuous Delivery Pipelines. Solving problems with software is difficult. Computers, even smart AI systems, are fundamentally stupid. They do exactly what we tell them to do, and let's be honest, we're not that great at seeing every possible eventuality that may arise. One of the most enlightening experiences that almost any software developer can have is watching someone else use their software in the real world. Blimey, I never thought they'd do that, is probably the commonest response. So a huge part of writing software at every scale is to imagine how things can go wrong. My first and extremely common mistake is that fo teams focus only on the happy path. Assuming that your system will always work perfectly, be used only in the narrow optimistic way that you imagined, possibly with fluffy clouds and singing birds in the background, is, I'm afraid, magical thinking. It's just done. It's never going to happen. I was once asked to consult with a bank about building resilient systems. A group of us assembled in a room to talk about it. None of us had met before, so the conversation was a little bit stilted. So I thought that I'd kick things off. So I said, well, obviously the first thing to think about with resilient systems is that things are going to break all of the time. There was stunned silence. Then somebody said, we thought our job was to make sure that things never broke. Things will break. Your users won't do what you expect, mostly accidentally, but sometimes maliciously. As software developers, we can't live in Disney World. We have to think and design defensively. How far you need to take this changes depending on how valuable or dangerous, I suppose, your system is. But this is always true. Always think, what happens if... Play through the negative scenarios as well as the one with the birds tweeting. If you're writing a function, what happens if somebody sends you values that you didn't expect? What happens if the disk is full or the file isn't there? Or that great third-party library that you're using throws an ex exception? If you're working with concurrency in any form, then you're already running with scissors, so take great care. You really need to think carefully about what that means and how it can go wrong. If you're building a distributed system, what happens if the load is too high? What happens if it's too low? In the cloud, you may up spending a lot of money if you get this kind of thing wrong. What happens if some hacker breaches your web tier? What happens if your software goes crazy and starts bleeding money? And so on. This is a lot to think about, but this is our job. You can't rely on somebody else to tell you all of this stuff. I think it's part of the duty of care for professional software developers at some level to be thinking like this. Because other people don't. The really difficult part is that sometimes it's okay to decide to defer some of this stuff in order to be able to make progress, and sometimes it's not. These are not simple choices, but the starting point, the minimum standard in my opinion, is to at least know when you're making the choice to defer dealing with something risky. 
Tweeting birds and fluffy clouds don't really cut it. This is fractal. It's true at the level of a few lines of code and at the level of globally distributed production systems. Think like an engineer. Think about how stuff can go wrong and only then decide whether to mitigate or to accept the risk. The next common mistake is code ownership. Do you have parts of the code that you think of as yours? Do you ever work outside of these parts of the code? Do other people ever work on your parts of the code? I think that's a big mistake for everyone involved for developers to own parts of the code base. Now, there is some nuance to this, of course. Uh, in a large code base, you will probably be working on a particular functional area. So working on some parts of the code more often than others, and knowing it better than the others too. But the point at which this really becomes a problem is if, when something outside of your part of the code base needs to change, do you have to raise a ticket or ask permission to change it from somebody else? As I said, there is nuance here. It may sometimes be wise to ask for help from someone who knows the tricky bit of code somewhere else better than you do. But in general, Shared code ownership is a stronger model than parts of the code being allocated to specific developers. The problem here is that there is what I think of as an old-fashioned view that you need someone, one person, to be responsible for each part of the code. I think that this is actually a terrible idea for several reasons. First, it narrows the focus of the person working on the code. Their focus narrows down only to think about their piece. They get more and more entrenched in that part of the code until effectively your whole development organisation is made up of one person sized silos. Every change requires the coordination of work and schedules of lots of different people. And then someone's off sick, goes on holiday or leaves. I've seen organisations where their progress on a feature is stalled because one person who worked on the crucial part of the system is on holiday. These are dysfunctional organisations. You need to break these one person silos. This makes the organisation more effective, more robust. It passes the rather macabrely named bus test. But it's also much better for the design of the system and for the developers when they have a broader view. If you're stuck in the code ownership trap, the best way that I know of to break out of it is to start pair programming. That way where you'll get to see the parts of the code that are less familiar, in the company of a local guide who, who can explain. Then you can guide someone else around your part of the code. This breaks down the barriers really quite quickly. I've spoken about this next problem here before. This is the idea that parts of the process of software development are somebody else's problem. One of my more cynical friends observes that software development only ever works because a small minority of motivated individuals make stuff happen. I think that might be a bit too cynical, but as cynical as it may be, there is certainly at least a grain of truth here. I think that while it's easy to focus on narrow, short-term or limited goals, handovers, sign-offs, definitions of done, hitting a velocity target or a release date, for example, in reality, whatever the nature of the software that we create, our job is not to achieve these artificial goals. It's to have an impact on our users and so further the aims of the organisations that we work for. We certainly want to enhance our own careers and learning, but a laser focus on the real outcome, great software in the hands of our users, helps us to deliver on those personal goals too. That doesn't mean blindly servicing customer requests. The users aren't always right. It means understanding the problem that we're trying to solve and taking the team and personal responsibility to solve it. Everything else is just a tool, a means to an end. Even the code that we write, so it isn't somebody else's job to tell you exactly what code to write. It isn't somebody else's job to allow you to keep your code base tidy and maintain it as a workable space. It isn't somebody else's job to grant you permission to test or refactor. 
or to test the code that you wrote. In the best organisations, it isn't even somebody else's job to tell you which problems to solve. When organisations get this stuff right, they create great software quickly and efficiently. It's about having everybody perceiving and taking ownership of all of these things to some degree. I was doing some consultancy for a client, a big organisation working in a complex problem domain. I was chatting with a developer who told me a story. They'd been working on a new feature and while doing so, they spotted a bug, so they fixed it. Later, a project manager heard and told them to put the bug back in because they hadn't been asked to fix it. Now, this is obviously dumb. There were some excuses, perhaps. They were working in a heavily regulated environment and so every change needed to be traced. But even so, whatever the reason, this was ba a bad call and a bad outcome for everybody. This is just the most extreme example that I've seen of people being afraid to change their own code. Usually, it's for much more prosaic reasons. Usually, they're scared of breaking stuff. Whatever your reason, if you're scared to change the code that you're working on, that's a big problem. I think that there's an illusion that's common to people who work on or near to code. That code is valuable in its own right and that we should work to get it right the first time and then leave it alone. Actually, I think this is a terrible idea. Our code is only ever our best guess so far. If we're not revisiting it and refining it as our learning deepens, then it will get less and less useful or our learning isn't deepening. OK, so this isn't 100% true. There are some unusual code systems that were written years ago and just keep going with no maintenance. But as soon as you allow for maintenance or updates, the situation's different. Now, learning's going on, and so you need to be able to change the code. As software pioneer Fred Brooks famously said, as soon as one freezes a design, it becomes obsolete. So, we need to retain our ability and our confidence to change our code. We need the skills and techniques that allow us to change it safely. Refactoring skills are an important tool in the box of any developer and a willingness to wield those tools is essential. Naturally, I can't leave this topic without reminding you that the best defense of all allowing, is allowing you the freedom to change your code safely are great tests. Again, not somebody else's job. Tests are essential tools to maintain our ability to change our code when we learn something new that changes how we think it should work. If you don't have good tests already, why not? Start writing tests for new work now. But even if you don't have great tests yet, you can use approval or characterization tests to support your ability to change the code safely. Check out my free refactoring demo on the training site to see, see that in action. Software development is a bit like gardening. We need to work constantly to stop our systems from growing weeds. Next, a focus on the tools rather than outcomes. The tools that we choose matter to us. If you're experienced, you're probably much better with the tools that you're familiar with than with something else. This is obvious, I know, but there is a difference between having a preference and being so focused on the tools that you exclude everything else. Important as our tools may be to us, they are largely irrelevant to the value that we create. Software is unusual in lots of ways, but one of the interesting ways in which it's unusual is that we can write any system in any technology. Any language that is Turing complete can, by definition, solve any problem that you can solve in any other Turing complete language. So the degree to which tools matter is really only down to the efficiency with which we can solve the problem in front of us. It would take me a long time to write a web app in Assembler, but I could do it. So it's not that tools are irrelevant, but rather that they aren't the point of what it is that we're doing. This loops back to what I said earlier. Our job is to solve the problem, not to wield the tools. It doesn't matter how well you know Vim or the JVM or Angular unless they help you to solve the problem more efficiently. 
When I used to lead development teams, my preference was that we let individuals pick their own tools. I was better at IntelliJ than in Eclipse, uh, but others were the other way around. Fine, so let us devs pick the tools that we prefer, as long as it doesn't stop us from achieving our real goal. It's inevitable, as the users of the tools, we will have a point of view. Some guitarists like Gibson, other, other, others like Fender but it's the music that matters. Learn your tools, get good with them, have an opinion, argue about them in the pub with your friends, but they're only a means to an end, and they aren't the most important part of our job. So you aren't a C-sharp programmer or a Haskell programmer. You aren't a Kubernetes developer or a VS Code developer. You're a software developer first, only after that, pick your tools appropriately to most efficiently achieve a desirable outcome. I seem to have been a bit more opinionated uh, in this episode and in the last few uh, lately. Let me know if you like more or less of this kind of thing. Thank you very much for watching.